Um, I'm honored to welcome today's speaker, Douglas Smith, a man who probably doesn't need much of an introduction because Douglas's books can be found on the shelf of any self-respecting fan of Russian history. So if you don't have any of his books, uh, you will have an opportunity to purchase them later. We will uh, drop a link to Douglas's um, website where you can take a look at uh, the fantastic work that he has done. Nonetheless, here's a brief introduction of our guest summarizing his many accomplishments and accolades. Douglas Smith is an award-winning historian and translator. He is the author of six books on Russia. His works have been translated into more than a dozen languages. Douglas studied German and Russian at the University of Vermont and has a doctorate in history from UCLA. Over the past 30 years, Douglas has made many trips to Russia. In the 1980s, he was a Russian-speaking guide on the U.S. Department, uh, State Department's exhibition, Information USA, that traveled throughout the USSR. He has worked as a Soviet affairs analyst at Radio Free Europe uh, slash Radio Liberty in Munich, and once served as an interpreter for late President Reagan. Douglas has taught and lectured widely in the United States, Britain, and Europe, and has appeared in documentaries for National Geographic, the BBC, and Netflix. His most recent book is The Russian Job, the forgotten story of how America saved the Soviet Union from ruin. Uh, and this book details the role of the American Relief Administration during the terrible famine of 1921 in the Soviet Union. Douglas is currently working on a new translation of Konstantin Postovsky's epic memoir, The Story of a Life. So thank you so much for joining us today, Douglas. Thank you to everyone who is joining our lecture today. I'm very, very much looking forward to your presentation, Doug, and please join me, everyone, in welcoming today's speaker. Great, thank you for that uh, nice introduction, Michael. Um, and thank you to, to Nick uh, and to Hannah for uh, this invitation and opportunity to, uh, to talk to everybody. And um, I really appreciate it. And thanks to everybody who signed up to listen to the talk. Uh, I know the women's final uh, at Wimbledon is, is over, so if you are trying to weigh options, uh, what, to, what to view today, um, maybe you were able to get in some tennis like I did and then uh, talk a bit about Russian history. Um, I was asked to talk about this book, Former People, that I uh, published almost 10 years ago. Um, hopefully it'll be new to most people who haven't heard of it or, or haven't read it. Um, it doesn't always happen that the idea for a book um, comes in some sort of immediate flash of, of inspiration, but that's sort of the backstory for this particular book. Um, I was researching uh, in the early 2000s, uh, a book that later came out as The Pearl, which was the story of Count uh, Nikolai Sheremetyev, one of the wealthiest, most uh, fantastic of, of aristocrats in Catherinian Russia. And um, as part of my research, I got to know descendants of the family, of the Sheremetyev family, including um, Nikita Sheremetyev and his wife, Maiko, who were then living in Connecticut. And in December of 2005, they invited me over for dinner. And I had a lovely evening and I was sitting in their beautiful dining room filled with Russian art and antiques. Um, and I was impressed to think that the Sheremetyevs had somehow managed to get uh, all of these things out of Russia during the chaos of the revolution and then and civil war. So I asked Nikita how they had done that and he had a little glint in his eye and he held up a, what looked like something sort of like a silver pate fork. And he said, no, Douglas, this is all that remains of the Sheremetyev fortune. Um, and it was like a light went off uh, in my head and I was thinking, oh my God, what would that be like, uh, this epic sort of story of, of riches to rags, of, of uh, a family that for centuries had had wealth and power and status um, to basically lose everything overnight. Those beautiful antiques uh, that they had in their home, Nikita told me, had all been purchased by his parents and grandparents in antique stores in Paris and Rome after the revolution. I was sort of further confirmed that uh, there was some sort of validity with the story about what had happened to the Russian nobility after the revolution. When I was uh, next back in Moscow and I was working in the, the Lenin library um, and I was going through the card catalog that had still not been digitized, uh, still not online and you still had to go through these old uh, paper card catalogs. 
And I was going through the thematic section on the great October socialist revolution. And they had sort of subcategories for every aspect of the revolution, but there was no card or section of cards that would show you literature on the story of the nobility in the revolution. So uh, I remember going up to one of the librarians there in the, uh, in the Lenin Library and saying, excuse me, I'm, I'm an ignorant, stupid foreigner, but I'm having trouble locating you know, uh, literature on the story of how the nobility was connected to the revolution. Uh, and she looked at me like I was you know, asking who's buried in, in Lenin's tomb and said, well, of course there's nothing on the nobility there because the nobility had nothing to do with the revolution and the revolution had nothing to do with the nobility. Um, which to me only seemed to be further proof that this was an uh, unexplored subject. I would also say that I encountered sort of somewhat similar dismissive comments uh, in the West, in the United States, and from fellow historians even, who sort of had this view that, of course, the Russian nobility was destroyed, the elites of Russia were destroyed after 1917, um, but they basically got what was coming to them that we needn't concern ourselves with it because it was obvious what indeed had happened to them and why. So basically the story as we know it, in 1917, crowds of hungry people take to the streets in February in Petrograd, demanding bread, peace, and end to the war. And within literally just a few days, the 300 year old uh, Romanov dynasty basically withered and collapsed and disappeared. Russia was obviously at war with Germany at the time and the country then descended into anarchy and chaos. In October, Lenin and the Bolsheviks overthrew the provisional government and seized power. And the communists would hold power in Russia for over 70 years until 1991. Now the story of the revolution has been told and retold from all sorts of possible angles. There are obviously shelves and shelves of books on Lenin and the Bolsheviks, on Nicholas II, on the role of workers and the peasants. But this, the story of the Russian nobility was one of those holes that had not ever been filled, one of those subjects that had been overlooked. I think for a long time in the Soviet Union, it was more or less a taboo subject and thus was never studied. And again, as I said, in the West, there was a sense that this was a class that was, was you know, fated to be wiped off the face of the earth. And it was obvious and didn't need further explanation. Now, I always felt that this was wrong for a couple of reasons. First of all, you know, the story of the destruction of an entire social class is in and of itself worthy of study. And also, it seemed to me as I worked on this, on this book that the fate of the nobility in a way tells us something about the nature of the Soviet state itself. And basically what I wanna get at, uh, and I try to explore a bit in the book, is that from the very beginning, the Soviet state, the Bolsheviks, once they came to power, and even on their way to power, were caught up in this notion that there were always enemies to be attacked, to be fought, that enemies were always lurking around the corner. And that was true whether it was the elite, whether it was the aristocracy and the nobility, Later in the 20s, whether it was the Nepmen, collectivization under Stalin, it was the Kulaks. Later you have you know, the concern for saboteurs and fifth column and foreign agents. So it seems to me that by looking at what happened to sort of one of the very first so-called enemies of the Soviet state, we, we can gain access and perspective on the Soviet experience itself. Now, first of all, it's, it's important to sort of, I think, erase any kind of um, false notions we have about what the Russian nobility was. It was never simply some sort of class of the, of the idle rich. Um, and from its earliest origins, it was a service class, men who worked in the state administration, in the military, in the diplomatic corps, or served at the court. And for a long time, they, they formed the nucleus of Russia's ed educated classes. Now, there never really developed a large middle class uh, um, burgertum or bourgeoisie in Russia that you had in the West. And so even up to as late as roughly 1900, still nobles were sort of um, very much involved in major professions, be they doctors, teachers, lawyers, scientists, scholars, and, and engineers. And obviously we know that the nobility was hugely significant in the development of Russia's artistic and cultural life for centuries. And the names you know, are, are all right there before us, Pushkin, uh, 
Turgenev, Tolstoy, Rachmaninoff, uh, Vladimir Nabokov, um, all of them obviously were, were, were sons of the nobility. And they weren't just, um, if you will, writers and, and musicians and, and poets and things like that, but also some of the leading intellectuals. And in, in fact, some of the leading radical intellectuals were sons of the nobility. If you think of people like Mikhail Bakunin, uh, Prince uh, Pyotr Kropotkin, and even probably the greatest, most famous of all radical Russian noblemen, uh, Vladimir Ulyanov, better known obviously as Lenin. Now it's important to keep in mind that what made it possible for the nobility to, to create all of this art and culture and literature was the fact that they lived off of the labor of the vast peasant masses. And for centuries, obviously, this was a, a undeniably brutal system of, of human bondage. By the 18th century, serfdom in Russia really didn't even differ all that much from the horrors of chattel slavery in the United States. Um, there were repeated peasant rebellions against this oppressive system, you know, from the 17th century onward. You can think of, you know, the great Pugachev rebellion under Catherine the Great. Um, and it was basically the revolution of 1917 that can almost be seen as the greatest, the most violent um, of all of these peasant rebellions. When the peasants plundered all of the noble estates in the countryside, killed the masters and tried to drive them off the land once and for all. Before the revolution, there was roughly 2 million nobles living in Russia. And by 1922, five years later, there was perhaps only 50,000 of them left in the country. A great many had been killed in the revolution and subsequent civil war. Many more died of disease and starvation and untold thousands managed to escape to the West. By the early 1920s, an entire social class that had existed for centuries had basically been wiped out. Now, when I approached the story in the early phases of my research, I knew it was going to be sort of this vast epic um, chapter of history. So I needed to figure out a way to, to narrow the focus in, in such a fashion that it could become human and approachable and understandable. I knew I needed to sort of find a few representative individuals and families that would sort of carry the narrative through. And after a bit of back and forth, I ended up settling on two of the great aristocratic families in Russia, the Princess Galitsyn and the Counts Sheremetyev. And what I wanted to do in my talk today was to talk about two people from each of these family that later came together and, and brought the, the Sheremetyevs and the Galitsyns together. Prince Vladimir Galitsyn shown here was born in 1901 now the Galitsyns were a, an extremely old aristocratic family who had been serving the princes of, of Muscovy since the 15th century. They're also one of the largest of all the aristocratic families with, with over a dozen different uh, branches um, and you know, spread out all over the country. Prince uh, Vladimir here shown as a boy was born into a very liberal um, family. His, his grandfather, also Prince Vladimir Galitsyn, was the three-time mayor of Moscow, who was often in trouble with the, with the czarist authorities uh, for his liberal views, as was Vladimir's father, Mikhail, who was in fact spied on by the czarist police and deemed a subversive. This here shows uh, Countess Yelena Sheremetova on the left with two of her uh, sisters, um, Natalia uh, and Maria. Yelena was born in, uh, in the early years, 1902 or 1903 in Moscow, again, from one of these great aristocratic clans. Her uh, earlier uh, forefather, um, Boris, had been made the first Count Sheremetyev by Peter the Great for his daring do in the battles against, um, against Sweden. The family was fabulously wealthy, in part because it was not a terribly large uh, clan and thus was able to keep the wealth close um, and obviously through very strategic marriages over the generations. They had vast estates all across Russia. By the 19th century, 
uh, Dmitry uh, Sheremetyev owned something like 300,000 serfs. And to put that in some sort of context that we as Americans can understand, in the pre-Civil War South, the richest American slaveholder owned something on the balance of like 1,200 slaves. Uh, the Sheremetyevs had magnificent palaces uh, uh, and estates across, across Russia. Some of you, have, maybe you've been to Russia and visited some of these. This, for example, is Astankina uh, in Moscow, uh, which was built by um, Count Nikolai Petrovich Sheremetyev, chiefly as a theater to show off the talents of his uh, mistress and later uh, wife, secret wife, Praskovia, who performed as the Pearl. And then also uh, what is now inside Moscow, but used to be outside the city in the 18th century is Kuskova, um, one of the great summer palaces in Russia that is like Astankina, now a museum. This is a picture of the, of the Sheremetyev family at their estate of Mikhailovskaya, taken in June of 1915 at the height of the First World War, probably the very last photograph, joint photograph of the Sheremetyev family. Yelena sits on the grass in the white dress, second from left. Um, in the sort of center right uh, middle are her, her grandparents, sort of the patriarch of the family, uh, Count Sergei Dmitry Sheremetyev uh, in beard and, and dark coat looking off to the right, and his, his wife uh, next to him, Ekaterina. Uh, Count Sergei Dmitrich was an interesting figure. He was very much um, fascinated by history, by Russian history, by family history, he published a lot of uh, primary documents and the like, extreme sort of arch conservative. Um, he was a, a great lover of uh, Tsar Alexander III, the sort of strong iron-willed uh, Tsar and was profoundly disappointed in the last Tsar Nicholas II. Um, their son, Dmitry Sheremetyev, would have been Yelena's um, uncle, is shown in the far left in the uniform in the middle row. Um, he sort of grew up alongside the future Tsar Nicholas II and later served as his aide-de-camp. Um, after the revolution, he and members of his family fled Moscow for the Northern Caucasus, where they went through one hellish experience after another during the tumultuous early stages of the Civil War, barely escaping with their lives to the West in 1919. To uh, the right of Dmitri in the white dress, looking off to the side is Dmitri's sister, Maria Gudovich. Her husband, Alexander Gudovich, would be arrested and shot by the Bolsheviks in 1919. The man in the back row with the suit and tie and the dark hat was Prince Boris Vyazimsky. Vyazimsky was married to Dmitri's daughter, uh, Elizaveta Sheremetyeva, who's in the far right middle row in the white hat. He too would uh, succumb to truly gruesome fate when he was um, set upon by a group of soldiers at a railway station not far from his estate uh, in August of 1917 and beaten to death with metal rods and clubs. Dmitry Gudovich, who's the son of Maria Gudovich, uh, is down uh, on the grass uh, third from the right in the dark sh shirt. He would be arrested by the Bolsheviks multiple times and then finally arrested and shot in 1937 during the Great Terror. Varvara, his sister, who's standing in the top row far left, uh, also a, a granddaughter of uh, Sergei Dmitry Shermetyev, would be arrested in 1937 as well with her husband, Vladimir Abalensky, and he would be shot that year. And while I was researching the book, uh, there was still no solid uh, documentary evidence on whatever happened to her. Now, most people in Russia, including much of the nobility, saw sort of the moral rot that was at the core of the Tsar system by the early years of the 20th century. And the fact that revolution was coming did not come as, as a great surprise to most of them. Although what did shock them was the degree of violence and hatred uh, 
uh, centuries old uh, hostility against the elite that exploded in 1917 when people tried to destroy every last vestige of the old order. Um, there's some amazing series of paintings that, that capture exactly uh, sort of what was going on in Russia in 1917 and then in the first years following the revolution by an artist named Ivan Vladimirov. Uh, these paintings are now in the Hoover Institution collection down at Stanford University. This is one that he did uh, depicting what happened to a noble estate uh, not far from Pskov, but it, it captures some of the anarchy and looting that was going on uh, out in the countryside. You have here people basically walking off with the remains of a noble estate, the chair, the grandfather clock, uh, silver, a gramophone, and what have you. Now, Lenin and the Bolsheviks did not create the class warfare that swept over Russia in 1917, 1918, but they used it and they exploited it and they furthered it and intensified it for their own purposes. Lenin obviously had long been against World War I, but it wasn't because he was against war itself what he wanted was to shift from what he called the imperialist war of nation against nation and generate instead a class war. He wrote in September 1917, quote, a revolution, a real profound people's revolution, to use Marx's expression, is the incredibly complicated and painful process of the death of the old order and the birth of the new social order, of the mode of life of tens of millions of people Revolution is the most intense, furious, desperate class struggle and civil war. Now, obviously Lenin as a good Marxist believed that class struggle was the motive force of history. And he believed that the future belonged to the workers and to the peasants and that the old elites would be swept away as the new order was created and the old was destroyed. And they classed these former people, if you will, Buifri Ludi people of the past, former people. The new Bolshevik government immediately set out to expropriate the expropriators, as they called it. They seized the land from the elite. There were ongoing house searches for money and art, for food, jewels, and clothing. They raided all the banks and cleaned out the safe deposit boxes and vaults. Um, they even kicked much of the elite out of their, out of their homes or they forced them to give up everything but one single room, what the Russians called uplatnenya or consolidation. And if you've uh, read Dr. Zhivago or, or, or seen uh, the famous uh, film, you know that story, a scene when, when Zhivago comes back to the family home and it's full of strangers and uh, the family has been reduced to, to sharing one single room. Rent and utilities uh, were tagged to social status pre-1917. The higher your social status under the old regime, the higher rates you paid. And then when famine hit the country, um, rations were also based on one's social status. Not only that, all former people were required to register with the authorities and make their whereabouts known. They were often forced out to engage in humiliating and often rather useless, pointless public works projects. Here's an example of, of the former elite clearing away ice and snow from the streets in, in Petrograd. And it wasn't long before literally the great wealth that had been amassed over centuries had been completely dispossessed and expropriated. Here's an example of a, a former uh, czarist general forced to uh, subsist by selling matches on the streets of Petrograd. Now the coup in October of 1917 unleashed a, a civil war that would rage for three years and leave over 10 million people dead, leave Russia impoverished and play a major role in the outbreak of a terrible famine in 1921 that would claim the lives of millions more. People all over the country were hungry the Sheremetyevs, Yelena Sheremetyeva and her family spent those years chiefly in Moscow that were cold and hungry and, and, and bitter. Um, again, one of these Vladimirov paintings captures what life was like uh, during the civil war years for, for, the, uh, the, for the former people. Um, they've been reduced to, to one room 
They're, they are trying to heat this space with the bourgeoisie, the little stove there. You see them mending with a sort of jerry-rigged uh, um, a tube to take the smoke out. Uh, the floor is being chopped up to feed the fire. Uh, the few remaining uh, personal possessions they have are, are stacked up on the piano. There's a, a woman's boot, some silverware, some, some um, china, and a couple books and things that they will probably be hawking for food. And you have sort of the, the, the bucket under the table that is either being used to schlep water um, or perhaps even as a, uh, as a provisional, as we would call it for Minnesota, biffy or or toilet. The, the, the extent to which uh, famine took over the country in these years is, is difficult for us to conceive of. Again, another Vladimir painting that captures uh, a fairly typical scene, a, a horse that has uh, died of, of starvation, exhaustion, falls in the streets in Petrograd, and within minutes, people descend on it, uh, hacking it up and taking it off to eat at home. Everything was consumed. There are even stories uh, that are accounted in the book about how uh, the horse's hooves would be cut off and then boiled for, for long periods and then allowed to sit to make a sort of gelatinous uh, mass that people would, would consume as well. Yelena was forced to drop out of school during these years uh, because her main preoccupation and, and way of spending time in those days and helping the family was to stand in lines to try to collect a, a bit of food to bring back. The extended Sheremetyev family broke apart. Some members of it escaped to the north, to Finland, and then to the west. Others, as I mentioned, like her uncle Dmitri and some of his family, went to the Caucasus and then eventually made their way uh, to, to Italy. For those who remained in Moscow, there was the constant threat of, of raids by the Cheka, of arrests. Two of Yelena's uncles were arrested and then executed. And by the end of the Civil War, there was only one male Count Sheremetyev left in all of Russia. Other members of the nobility fled the cities of Petrograd and Moscow for their country estates, thinking that they would be both safer and that it would be easy for them to gain access to food. Still, these folks were subjected to various raids by Red Army troops, uh, by Cheka agents, and often also by uh, angry local peasants living in the area. And even they too were eventually all driven from their former estates. Many of the men were often arrested. This is a picture of, of the Galitsyns at their estate of Bakorodetsk, uh, taken in the early 1920s. That's Prince Vladimir Galitsyn in the back row in the, in the sailor's suit. Um, uh, his father was arrested and put in one of the concentration camps, Mikhail Galitsyn, that's him. Uh, seated in the white shirt and tie just below Vladimir. And he was held there for quite some time before eventually being released. Um, his relatives managed to survive there, but just barely. His family was worried that, that Vladimir would be conscripted into the Civil War. So they managed to get him sent to the far north where he went out on an Arctic expedition um, put together by the Norwegians. And so basically he was saved the traumas of the war. He came back here to Bogorodetsk in 1921 to mark the golden wedding anniversary of his grandparents who are seated in the center, the former mayor of Moscow, uh, Vladimir Kalitsyn and his wife, Sofia, there in the middle, extent, surrounded sort of by their extended family, of siblings, cousins, aunts and, and, aunts and uncles. I think that the, the photograph does a good job of, of capturing the, the hardship that this family has experienced over the past four years. Um, obviously, what it doesn't capture is the hardship that is waiting for them uh, just around the corner. Of the 22 people in this photograph, 13 of them would be arrested in the coming years. Five of them would leave the country for good. Five of them would either die or be shot in prison. And of the folks pictured here, none suffered more than the Trubetskoys who were married into the Galitsyn family. Prince Vladimir Trubetskoy, who's shown in the very back row, his face is somewhat obscured next to, next to Vladimir, would be repeatedly arrested and exiled under, under the Soviets. 
and then eventually shot as an enemy of the people in October of 1937. And on that very day he was executed, so too was his daughter Varvara Trubetskaya, who was shown in the photograph in the very bottom right corner with the dark hair. Vladimir's son Grigory Trubetskoy would be arrested in 1937 um, and spend 10 years in the gulag. He's in the, in the bottom center of the picture, just below uh, Sofia holding the dog. Vladimir's daughter, Alexandra, would be arrested in 1937 and spend 10 years in the gulag. And they would release her into freedom uh, after, uh, at the age of 24, just before she could die of exhaustion. She's shown far right sitting with her mother with her fingers in the mouth. Vladimir's wife, there holding uh, Alexandra, um, born Elizaveta Galitsina, uh, was denounced as a German sympathizer during the war in 1943, ended up in Butyrki prison in Moscow and died that same year of typhus. Now for the young, former people, the young members of these aristocratic noble families who had survived the revolution and the civil war. By the end of the war, by the beginning of the, the NEP period, there was this longing for some sort of return to a normal life, a longing for, for fun. They were young, uh, they had survived, um, and they wanted to sort of find a way to make their life in the new Soviet state as best as they could, despite what had happened to the social class that they, that they came from. They began to throw parties. Many of them returned to Moscow to look for work or to study. Um, here's a picture of Prince Vladimir Galitsyn and Elena Sheremetyeva um, from around the time that they truly became close uh, and fell in love in Moscow at one of these parties of, of young former people. After a short courtship, they, they married in, in 1923. And from everything we know about them, it was a, a truly loving marriage and relationship. They settled there in, in Moscow, stayed in Moscow and moved into an apartment that housed a large collection of basically the, all of the Galitsyns within that family that had managed to survive. Now, although the NEP, the new economic policy in the, in the 1920s are, are known as a period of, of relative safety, security, um, of toleration and what have you. This was not necessarily the case for the members uh, of the former nobility. Throughout the 1920s, they were repeatedly subjected to waves of arrests and, and repression and what have you. Vladimir, like many people of his, of his class, was unable to find work for a long time. He was a, a talented artist, a talented drawer and draftsman, and he was able to get sort of freelance work doing commissions, uh, doing book illustrations, designing board games, um, designing packaging for various goods and things like that. All of this sort of on the side as a way to bit, earn a bit of money to keep the family afloat. This is some examples of some of his work. This is a, a book jacket that he did for uh, some poems Yakutyonik Aleska, the little Yakut boy Aleska. Uh, this is another one of, uh, of his illustrations that he did, clearly very, very talented. Uh, and then this third one I really like. Uh, this is his, I guess, what a Russian thought America must look like uh, with the, uh, the very futuristic uh, car and the incredibly uh, well, well dressed people and what have you. Now, it wasn't long before uh, Yelena and Vladimir started a family. They ended up with three children. In the middle there is, is Yelena Galitsina and her two brothers, Mikhail and Ilarion. As I said, NEP was not an easy time um, for most of these former people. Uh, Vladimir here uh, with his son Ilarion was arrested for the first time in May, 1925, along with his father, as what the Soviets called, quote unquote, socially dangerous elements. A month later, he was freed. The second arrest came in April, 1926, when he was charged with espionage. Um, like many uh, of the nobles, he had had contact with foreigners, partially due to the 
the education they had, they, they had been of, of help and of service and able to find employment with foreigners who had come to Russia over these years. For Vladimir, it had to do with the, his uh, Arctic exploration that he had been on with the Norwegians. He was held for two weeks, questioned as a potential spy, and then eventually released. Now, with the rise of Stalin in the late 1920s, the, the revolution is sort of reinvigorated and the class war uh, is reignited and the old elite is attacked with a new fervor that had not been seen since the time of the revolution. A whole new uh, wave of repressive measures are carried, uh, carried out against the former people, including families uh, like the Galitsyns. In October of 1929, the Galitsyns who had managed to remain in Moscow were told they had three days to pack up everything and leave and move uh, outside the boundaries of the city to a hundred kilometer limit further north. And they ended up in the town of Dmitriv. And it was here that uh, Vladimir was arrested now for the third time in October, 1933, when he was charged with both counter-revolutionary propaganda and being part of a plot to assassinate Stalin. Several of his cousins were arrested on the same charges at this time. He was held in the Butyrki prison in Moscow for five months and then given a three year suspended sentence uh, in March of 1932, 34 and allowed to return to his family. This was seen by folks at the time as something of a, of a victory because many were convinced that Vladimir would never be allowed to return. He was in Dmitriev at their home uh, on the morning of June 22nd, 1941, when Vladimir heard over the radio of the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union. He was getting ready to take uh, the kids on a fishing expedition that day. And he knew immediately what was going to happen, that the authorities would be taking former people as prisoners, almost as hostages, and as suspected fifth column supporters of the Germans. And as he was walking with his sons on what he probably figured would be the last fishing trip, he discussed this very fact with one of the other adults and his son, Michael, overheard it and knew that the time he had left with his father would probably be limited now. In October of that year, 1941, indeed agents of the security Oregon showed up at the house and arrested Vladimir on a charge of anti-Soviet agitation. As they were leading him away, his son Mikhail followed him down the road until finally the agents told the boy to go back home. In March of 1942, Vladimir was given a sentence of five years in a corrective labor camp. Um, and the family knew that they may well never see him again. He was sent to a makeshift prison at a former monastery at Sviyashk on the Volga River. And he very quickly fell ill with pellagra, basically a result of poor diet and niacin deficiency, not that uncommon in the prisons at that time. Most of the time there he spent in the infirmary and he kept getting sicker and sicker and nothing seemed to improve his health. Um, he wrote a series of letters home to his family during these final months that he was uh, in, in prison there at Sviyashk. And I wanted to read some of them. They're, they're truly sort of heartbreaking. I should say, when I was first researching this section of the book, I was living in London, and I was invited to give a talk about my research um, at Oxford University. And I had been in, sort of engrossed in this aspect of the, of the, the family story. And I, I went to give this talk. For the first time, I was reading these letters before a public audience, and I literally was overcome by a, a, emotion. Um, I sort of didn't realize how much um, they had sort of gotten to me. My dearest wife, here's Vladimir and Yelena in a happier moment, uh, looking out the window of their home in Dmitriev. My dearest wife, will I ever see you again? Do you recall how I studied your face in the final minutes before I left? I felt that we'd not see each other for a long time, but that it would be this long, none of us could have imagined. In late 1942, Vladimir's father died and he wrote to his mother. My beloved mama, of course I have awaited the news of papa's death, but it's so, so sad. When I left you, I parted with him knowing it was forever. 
But you, my dear old one, live, live for my return. Mama, bless your poor son. Vladimir wrote again to his wife. My dear one, I'm living through my memories. I remember every detail of our daily life as if looking through a magnifying glass. And it is both depressing and sweet. What sentiments? This year has taught us all a great deal. By the final weeks of the year, the rations in the camp were getting worse and worse. Vladimir began to imagine the end. And he wrote one more time to Yelena. We must count on the worst. And then if I manage to get out of here, it will be a miracle. Pelagra is a terrible thing. My dearest, we must see each other once more. We must, but when? Making a calendar for 1943, I keep staring at the dates, but perhaps I'm to perish here and my life outside these walls has ended. Oh, but how I want to go on loving you. Not long after he wrote that letter, Vladimir died on the 6th of February, 1943, at the age of 41. His body was taken out of the infirmary and placed in a common grave outside the monastery walls in a pit that overlooks the Volga River. In September of 2010, I was in Moscow doing research for this book uh, and had arranged a meeting with Nikolai Trubetskoy, grandson of Vladimir uh, Galitsyn and Yelena Sheremetyeva. Um, we met at a uh, famous old Russian restaurant uh, called TGI Fridays that was blasting Beyonce, uh, but we still were made, able to, to have a conversation about his family, about their history, um, and about his own remarkable life in Russia and the Soviet Union. He told me that of his four grandparents, uh, three of them died in prison. The only one who did not was his grandmother, Elena Sheremetyeva. And I asked him if, if, if she had talked about the, the family's history and their experiences um, before and after the revolution. And, and he said, yes, she had told him a great deal, including the fact that by her estimation, as many as 300, mem 300 members of the family had been killed by the Bolsheviks in the Soviet state. Um, and, he, and he asked her, well, can you forgive them for what they've done? And she said, oh, I've, I forgave them long ago. I will never forget. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Douglas, for a fantastic lecture. Uh, so, so poignant, and I'm sure that there's much, much more in the book uh, for those who have not read it yet. So I do encourage all of you to, uh, to purchase Douglas's book. We'll be putting a link to his website in the chat section for anybody who's interested in doing so. Um, and I also wanted to thank everyone who joined us for today's lecture. We are gonna move on to the question and answer uh, section soon. Um, but if you have enjoyed today's lecture, I hope that you'll tell your friends about the museum, about these lectures, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel and share it with your friends as well, where we have recordings from past uh, lectures. And also I wanted to thank everyone who has been supporting us, uh, the 25 people who have, um, as a result of signing up for the lecture, made uh, generous donations to the museum. We have some continuing supporters and we of course appreciate all that you do uh, that make this lecture possible. And uh, thank you to all of our first time donors who have made a generous contribution. If any others would like to join uh, these generous supporters of ours, um, we'll be putting in a link to a donation page and whatever you feel comfortable donating, every dollar goes towards supporting um, programs like these and the preservation and exhibition of wonderful artifacts that have uh, very interesting poignant stories similar to the ones that you have heard in this lecture today, reflecting the fate of the people who own them. Um, I do want to point out the museum is currently open. We do also offer uh, group tours. We uh, have in-person tours again, thankfully. Um, so if you're ever in the area, do stop by, go to our website, sign up for a weekly tour, or if, you, if the timing does not um, suit you, then you can um, sign up for a custom tour um, at a different time that is convenient for you. So do get in touch with us about that. Um, 
Before we go on to the question and answer se uh, section, I want to invite our curator, Nick Nicholson, to talk about a program that we're going to have later in the month, um, part of our Collecting Stories series with a special guest. And um, Nick was going to tell you about what to expect and how you can sign mm -hmm. up. Um, and in the meantime, thank you again, Douglas, for a fantastic lecture. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today and have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Thanks very much for the brief introduction, Michael, and I will keep it short. Uh, for those of you who joined us last time for our first Collecting Stories series, you were able to join us for an extraordinary interview with Dorothy McFerrin, and uh, who was one of the great collectors of Fabergé, whose Fabergé collection is in the uh, Houston Museum of Fine Arts. And uh, Dorothy and Jennifer were very kind and donated their time, and we had a very exciting conversation about collectors and collecting. This month, last week of July, we're going to be meeting with Captain Peter Sarandinaki, who is the president of the Search Foundation, which is the foundation that has gone on a number of organized searches to find the remains of the Romanos uh, located around Russia. It's going to be an exciting and important and timely conversation with Peter Sarandinaki, uh, particularly as we move towards November when the Church Council will be meeting in Moscow to make its final decision concerning the veracity of the Ekaterinburg remains. So I hope that you'll pay attention to our website and to our Facebook page. It's going be very easy to sign up for this intimate conversation online. We hope you'll join us on Thursday, the 29th of July at 6 p.m. Again, we'll be sending out an email and you'll be able to find us online. And now I will turn this back over to our main attraction, Douglas Smith, your questions, and my colleague, Hannah. Thank you so much. All right, everyone. So already some fantastic questions in the chat. I'm making my way through now. Uh, and of course, if there are questions that we do not quite get to during the live event, we maintain a registry and a log of your inquiries. So we will have those on the books. Um, so Douglas, first off, thank you again for a fantastic lecture. A lot of notes and thanks uh, from our audience here. And I'll begin with Lady Agnes's question. And she writes, when things looked so hopeless, maybe around 1921, was it possible for the former nobles to escape the Soviet Union? Um, thank you. Uh, it was increasingly difficult by, by 21. Um, the Soviet state was already starting to monitor borders um, and uh, pretty much things had, I would say, closed to the extent that one could really try to freely get out of the country. Um, the, the best chances were those who, who fled early on, you know, 1917, 1918. By, by 21, it, it was increasingly difficult to get out. Uh, the borders were being watched more closely. There are a couple of stories I have in the book of, of people making their way um, out through the north through um, Petrograd up into Finland and that sort of thing. Um, but no, it was, it was a very much a, a, a more difficult situation by 21. Wonderful, thank you. So next inquiry is from Conrad Phillips. Uh, and he writes, I have read a two volume biography of Joseph Stalin. In it, Stalin liked to ask those around him what you're still here. From there, it was a game of cat and mouse regarding what happened next. In your book, the authorities played a similar game, arrest, release, exile, execution. Was this action a planned state policy? Um, you know, what's interesting when you're talking about how the, the elites were treated by, by the Bolsheviks and by the, the fledgling Soviet state, um, on one hand, they very much were intent on destroying every vestige of the old order in part because they worried about its you know, revival, about it you know, finding a way to survive and come back. And so there was a sense of, you know, if we pull it out by the roots, there's no way it can survive. But they quickly realized that it was in fact the, the, the elites that had the education and skills and talents that they needed to try to run a state. Um, and when it became clear that revolution was not gonna spread uh, to Germany and Europe and throughout the world, and that they would have to try to go it alone as the first socialist state, they very much needed the talents of these people, people that they didn't trust, that they viewed as enemies. And so there was this sort of push-pull thing that was going on um, up through into the Stalin period, where on one hand, they'd be arrested, they'd be repressed, but they would also then um, need their talents and, and, and make use of them. 
So it was a, a strange sort of um, uh, a strange sort of dynamic that went on. Um, I would say up until through the 30s, and by then, you know, there were new cadres of educated people, and, and they didn't need to require the talents of the the old elite that they did in those in those early years. And I would just say they were an easy scapegoat. They were an easy scapegoat. Um, if if there were problems, if if the the system was not living up to its goals and dreams and aspirations, it was it was an easy way to deflect uh, popular anger and sentiment and say, well, we have these wreckers and saboteurs in our midst, and they're all you know members of the old guard, former elites who are actively trying to um, undermine the building of the new Soviet state. So it became a safety valve for letting off um, popular. Uh, uh, hostility and, and dissatisfaction. Thank you. So another inquiry from Lady Agnes, kind of relevant, I'd say, to the tail end of that last answer. Uh, when did the persecution stop and or lessen? Uh, I would say they didn't really stop until you get through World War II. Um, there was this, 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 this sort of final wave of arrests were the ones that uh, Prince Vladimir Galitsyn was involved in in the early years. Uh, following the uh, the Nazi invasion, um, in the post-war period, there's just very little left, I'd say, uh, of of the old uh, of the old elite. There are you know representatives of these families, but um, as a social order, as a as a class, they've been completely decimated. Um, but they are still you know these are people that for the most part, um, not all of them, but many of them have learned to if not hide their background, not talk about it, not make it public. Um, there's a, there was a famous uh, incident um, where uh, Ilarion Galitsyn, son of, of Vladimir and Yelena here, who became a, a wonderful uh, artist uh, in his own right, was speaking at some official function uh, and Khrushchev was present. And when Galitsyn got up to speak, he's, you know, Khrushchev bellowed, what Galitsyn, what a prince? What, like, how dare we be hearing from sort of a prince? And, and Ilya Aron said, no, no, a hudoznik, an artist, not a prince. I'm speaking as an artist. So, but by, by that period, I would say that, you know, the concern with these folks was pretty much spent. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, question from Olga. It says, uh, Olga writes, how have things turned out for the descendants of the Sheremitas and Galitsyn, excuse me, families in immigration? Uh, that's a really good question. I would say, um, from my experiences, they've they've turned out very well. I would, um, uh, you know, I would say the the ones who managed to to get out of Russia have you know fared better than the ones that did not manage to get out or chose not to leave. Um, uh, the the Sheremetyevs um, have all done well, and I've been fortunate to become friends with many of them, Nikita and and Michael, who are sadly no longer with us. Um, but their but their but their children. Uh, I've gotten to know members of the of the Galitsyn family, both in uh, outside Paris and in, in the UK um, uh, and in the United States. And you know, they the, the thing is, is people of that um, segment of the nobility, the higher rungs. They when they when they left, true, they didn't leave with with more than they could probably carry. But they they were all highly educated, spoke multiple languages. And the years following were difficult, but they managed, I think, to get to, to get on their feet, kind of thing. Um, and you know, just one example is I live in Seattle, Washington, and uh, not far north of, of us is a wonderful winery called Quill Cedar Creek. Little plug for them if you like good Cabernet Sauvignon. They're one of the finest uh, makers in the in the country, and uh, the owners uh, and operators of that vineyard are Galitsyns, members of that. Uh, very same princely clan. So I'd say for the most part, those who got out fared, fared all right. Thank you. Uh, now a question for those who stayed. Uh, Lady Agnes writes, what was to stay for after their possessions and status had been, had been taken, excuse me, there was only danger left. How possible was it to leave? Well, again, as I said before, it, in the chaos and the bloodshed of, of the Civil War, it was not, it was not easy to find your way out. Uh, plus, you have to remember that, you know, until late 1918, you, you couldn't escape to the, to the West because the war was still going on. You know, there was a front there. 
Um, so that was basically impossible. So the really, you had only like three options. One was to try to get out north to Finland, which was doable early on, but then became more and more a hardened kind of border. South through the, the Caucasus, which was completely swept up in the Civil War and extremely dangerous. And then some um, people took uh, the furthest route and went east all the way across Siberia to the Far East uh, and made their way th out that way. Um, I, uh, there's an amazing sort of sub story in here about um, uh, some of the Galitsyn family who got in, a, in a, basically a freight car and made their way across um, all of uh, Russia, Siberia and the Far East um, and had one harrowing experience after another. I mean, you could make a movie just, just of their particular flight um, to safety, eventually making it uh, to Seattle and then down to LA um, and became very successful down in, in Los Angeles in both in the movie industry and as, as medical doctors and things. So um, it just got very, very difficult to escape that chaos and bloodshed. Thank you again. Now, um, another question here from the audience from Marie, is there any indication why uh, these individuals decide to have children despite the uncertain times that they were inhabiting and facing? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And one of the things that I, I, I took away with um, through my work on this book, the research, um, and also getting to know the families was you know, despite what's remarkable is despite all the misery, despite the violence, the hardship, the suffering, you know, daily life goes on and people fall in love and they, they want family. And, um, you know, they're also, they're members of these proud aristocratic clans that have, have you know, been around for centuries. They wanna, I think also sort of keep that, keep that going. Um, but one of the things that really, um, moved me in my research on this would, would be reading some of these families' letters and diaries and things like that. And, and their, their strength of character, uh, no one gave up, no one quit. Um, everyone tried to find a way to make some kind of life for themselves in a very hostile environment. Um, and I was really touched by, by so much of this. I remember I was reading um, the diary of um, the, the mayor, former mayor of Moscow, so Vladimir Galitsyn's grandfather, um, the three-time mayor of Moscow. And he was writing about how he went out for a walk in Moscow. I think it was like in the morning, some morning in 1919. So, you know, absolute misery, chaos, hunger, you name it. And he records how he went out for a walk in the morning with his grandson, named after him, shown here, Vladimir Galitsyn, and was holding his hand and the beauty of the morning light as it played you know, through the streets of Moscow and what a feeling it was to be out walking together alone with his grandson. Um, and it was really powerful. This again, to, this ability to, to see the positive amidst all of this, of this horror. And in fact, sort of a side story, it was, it was, <sighs> my wife says I'm a method writer that I take all this stuff, you know, too much <laughs> to heart and I get into the role of it too much. But, you know, I would, when I was researching this book and I would read these documents and get to know these, these people through their documents and you really kind of come to inhabit sort of their life on some level and to see what they were going through and would strive and continue and then do that for eight or nine hours and then go to a dinner party in Seattle with people and, um, listen to us typical Americans of a certain class, maybe, I don't know, complain about, you know, little Johnny didn't make the varsity hockey team or, you know, our, our trip to Puerto Vallarta was delayed by two hours. And it was like, all I could do not to get up, you know, and say, you know, here you, how dare you complain about these petty little things. My wife would have to kick me uh, under the table to shut up. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, life still goes on. All right, so just a few more questions here before we wrap things up. Uh, Andrew writes, how did the Moscow airport get the Sheremetev nomenclature when Soviets purged uh, nobility and nomenclature? Well, from what I understand, and I'm not an expert in this, but uh, the Sheremetev airport um, was named after the little village of Sheremetev that had been there 
it was then I think largely bulldozed to make way for, for the airport. Um, I don't really know all the history behind it, but of course there were the Counts Sheremetyev who were the sort of the aristocratic titled line of the family. There were non-titled noble Sheremetyevs, but there were other Sheremetyevs who were, who were not nobility. I'm assuming that Sheremetyevo where the village was probably had once been uh, Sheremetyev lands. Um, it's also possible that by the time the airport was, was, was built, um, again, this was less of, a, of an issue, less of, a, less of a concern, and they just went with the name of, of the, local, the local village there. And if you, I don't know if you were to ask, you know, people traveling through there in, this, in the Soviet times, you know, does this, this, this name, you know, make you think of the, the Count Sheremetyev? I'm not sure how many people would have said yes. Again, because the talk about nobility and all that kind of thing was, was, you know, was not encouraged in those days, obviously. All right, now my apologies for jumping a little bit back in the chronological timeline here, but just noting a question from Richard Cooper. How many, if any, of the nobles were among the intelligentsia uh, exiled in 1922? So. Right, so there was the, the what became known as the so-called philosopher's ship, which was actually more than more than one ship, um, but basically exactly uh, leading intellectuals that were rounded up and arrested, um, uh, basically you know on more or less on, on Lenin's orders as troublemakers and um, sent out from from Petrograd uh, to the west. Um, some, I don't know the exact numbers, I'm not gonna lie and make it up off the top of my head. I honestly don't know how many of them belong to the, to the nobility. Um, and the, only, you know, the only name that, that I can think of off the top of my head who was on that, 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 that um, ship, one of those ships was uh, Piterim Sarokin, who obviously went on to become one of the great sociologists of the 20th century, and, and he was he was among those that was sent out. But I'm not going to make up some sort of number. I'd have to I'd have to look into that. Fantastic, thank you. So there are a few more audience questions that I'm going to maintain in our log that we will not quite get to live, but again, I will maintain a log of. Uh, and we're going to conclude here with this question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, who asks, have any of the former people families gone back to Russia to live after the collapse of the Soviet Union? Um, I, I know that there were a good many of them who in the 90s went back to live and work there in various capacities, um, both Sheremetyevs uh, and Galitsyns. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm one off the top of my head I can think of is, is uh, Katya Galitsyn, who lives in, in London, a friend of mine, was very supportive of my research and very helpful, wonderful woman. And I know that she went back and studied art there and sculpture and, and, and she's done wonderful things there. Um, it was through her and I believe her late father that the Galitsyn Memorial Library was created in Petersburg, which is still operating and a wonderful cultural institution there. Um, and I know she lived in, in Petersburg for a number of years, but then later moved back. Um, I think I, I am not aware of any that have like gone back and stayed permanently. I think there was a great desire early on to reconnect with Russia. And there was a great interest among Russians to, to try to reach out to this part of their culture and history that they had cut off and been denied access to. Um, but like, not to end it on a downer note, but then at the end, I mean, once we go down Russia, it's kind of hard not to get there at some point. I mean, all of the great hope and dreams for building a, a, a new free um, pluralistic uh, Russian society that were there in the, in the 90s. Obviously, we know how that hall has ended. And I think most of those um, uh, descendants of these aristocratic noble families that, that went there to try to engage in the building of a new and better Russia uh, eventually ended up leaving and, and, and going back home many of them probably um, saddened by how things have turned out. All right, thank you again, uh, Douglas, for a fantastic lecture, for wonderful substantive Q&A, a lot more notes of thanks for the interesting talk and man magnificent presentation are coming through. Just wanted to make a no note of that to you. Uh, and to conclude with one final question, um, 
what is the current project that you're working on? And can we have a few more details on that before we conclude today's presentation? Thank you. That's a lovely lead in. Um, so uh, uh, the book that made me fall in love with Russia uh, is one that most people in the West have never heard of. Um, it's called The Story of a Life, Povist Ajizny in Russian. Uh, and I encountered it in my first year in college when I was just uh, beginning to learn Russian. And it was written by this wonderful Russian writer, Konstantin Paustovsky, who was extremely beloved in Russia, wrote a good deal, um, was also just an incredible human being, um, was uh, nominated for the Nobel Prize in literature a few times, but uh, unfortunately went to Sholokhov um, because the Swedes didn't dare anger the Soviets having just a few years earlier given it to Pasternak. Um, here's a picture of Marlena Dietrich in Moscow in June 1964. She went to the Soviet Union um, on, a, a, on one of her tours. And uh, when she arrived in Moscow, they said, is there anyone in, in the Soviet Union you want to meet while you're here? And she said, I need to meet Konstantin Paustovsky. I, I think if I were to, to only be allowed one book and put on a desert island, deserted island, uh, it would be his uh, story of a life. And so she gave a performance at the, the, the House of Writers there in Moscow. Paustovsky, who was recovering from a heart attack, was in the audience and was brought up on stage. And she was so overwhelmed to be in the presence of this author that she loved so much, she, she fell to her knees. He was a true gentleman. He wanted to lift her up, but his doctor was in the audience and he yelled, Astav, you, Astav, leave her, leave her, don't touch her. You're going to have another heart attack. So he had to kind of wait for help. But I've spent the past several years translating a sort of a new translation and, and edited translation of the first three volumes of his epic memoir, which is still 700 pages. And that'll be published in the UK with Vintage Classics in January. And then it'll be out here with New York Review Books um, sometime after that. So I really encourage people, if you've not read Paustovsky and this work, to pick it up. It is truly one of the great um, memoirs of the 20th century. All right, so on that note, uh, thank you again for the presentation. Thank you to all attendees. We will be in touch with a follow-up email containing the lecture recording of this event, uh, along with some other notes and details for upcoming programs from the museum, uh, links to find out more about Douglas Smith's other work, uh, have a great afternoon, evening, morning, etc., wherever you may be, uh, and we'll hopefully see you next month for the next Second Saturday presentation. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you.